The possessions of the House of Habsburg, the masters of European dynastic politics, emerged as a formidable power in the 15th century, becoming the world's first superpower in the 16th century, and would endure as an illustrious, if diminishing, force until their glory was finally extinguished in the 20th century. As a dynasty which ruled over polyglot domains and at various times claimed universal authority as that of the emperors of the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs were never wedded to a single nation or community, as encapsulated in the notion, the ruler of all is the ruler of each, with each referring to the many Habsburg possessions from Castile to Hungary. With the Habsburgs, one can only conjure up appellations to gloss over the sheer breadth of their dominions, the Habsburg monarchy, the Austrian Empire. To refer to the Habsburgs as Austrians is only to refer to their point of origin and their eventual grave. Such was the logic of inventing an empire of Austria, which only glorified Austria in so far as it glorified the Habsburgs. When referencing a Habsburg empire, I speak of a process of continual adaptation, an empire governing the Americas centred on Madrid to an empire sprawling across the Danube centred on Vienna. During the 16th and 17th centuries, both empires existed simultaneously, though only the latter would survive until the 18th. By the 18th century, the global empire was gone, lost in a succession struggle, but the European empire survived. With the Romans, how can we say that the fall of Rome in 476 to the armies of Odovaca was the beginning of the end for the new Rome in Constantinople? Such is the case with the Habsburgs in the east. From the siege of Vienna by the Ottomans in 1683, Austria would advance to Belgrade and the borders of Bulgaria on the Danube. Despite the loss of the Spanish Empire to the Bourbons, the Austrian branch of the family would assert their mastery over modern-day Belgium and the principalities of Italy. During the disastrous reign of Emperor Charles VI, the Habsburgs retreated in the Balkans, lost Naples and Sicily, and ceased operations for the Ostend Company, the Austrian colonial enterprise that never was. The death of Charles VI was the trigger for Frederick the Great of Prussia to steal the Austrian's wealthy province of Silesia and for the Habsburgs to lose the imperial throne itself to another great German rival house, the Wittelsbachs of Bavaria. The Habsburgs recovered, prevented the dissolution of their remaining possessions and reclaimed the imperial title for themselves. Though Frederick the Great had imposed a new order on Germany by force, a system of German dualism between Austria and Prussia, Prussia's eventual ascent and unification of Germany was by no means a predetermined or even a conceivable outcome until the middle of the 19th century. In the 1770s, Austria eclipsed Prussia economically and in terms of manpower and land mass. As the significance of the Holy Roman imperial title waned, the future of Austria seemed predicated on asserting itself within Germany and emphasising the German character of the polyglot territories of the Habsburg monarchy. Joseph II attempted and arguably failed at both these endeavours, leaving the empire vulnerable to French invasion during the Napoleonic Wars. Having been soundly defeated by Napoleon in three successive conflicts, the Habsburgs exchanged the Holy Roman crown for an Austrian one. Indeed, when Napoleon went on to eviscerate the Prussians, effectively cancelling their great power status, for a moment Austria was the lone giant in Germany. Perhaps representing some culmination of the German policy of Joseph II, 1809 offered the Habsburgs a brief window of opportunity, an opportunity to unite Germany as part of a general rebellion against the French. Austria was taking advantage of what would later be termed the new humanism of the German Enlightenment and the Romantic periods, of a growing German national consciousness led by figures such as Schiller and Schlegel, the latter whom the Austrians would directly patronise. While Napoleon's defeat at the hand of the Austrians at Aspern-Essling offered a glimmer of hope for that enterprise, 
such hope was crushed at the Battle of Wagram. Austria, under its new potentate, Metternich, would lay to rest a Habsburg Germany, even attempting to smother German nationalism in its crib. The beginning of the end of the Habsburg Empire was not the result of its many defeats at the hands of Napoleon, but in its victory over Napoleon. Having dispensed with both the Holy Roman Empire and German nationalism, Austria nevertheless positioned herself as an anchor, an anchor for a new European order and a European peace. Austria nevertheless refused to accept that full responsibility, nor attempted to reconcile the inherent contradictions in the system it was responsible for creating. Austria was a local power, and a local power by design, while clinging to the lofty aspirations of a Habsburg Euro European imperium. The result of these contradictions and the subsequent process of Austria's unravelling are at once consistent with the Habsburg's ability to adapt, but this was a process of devolution, not evolution. With each setback during the 19th century, what it meant to be a Habsburg was recontextualized, limited and demoted. Every military defeat accompanied a political defeat. As the empire's influence contracted, so did the domestic power of its emperor. After Napoleon, the Austrian Empire was the greatest power in Central Europe. By the end of the 19th century, it was a diplomatic liability, and two decades later, it would not be at all. The causes of Austria's diminishment and subsequent demise were written into the formulas of the Congress of Vienna, with Austria itself presiding. I see these causes encapsulated in three major shortcomings of the treaties, the limitations and contradictions of a post-Napoleonic ideology for Europe, a series of missed opportunities and misreadings regarding nascent nationalism in Europe, and the nature of Europe's territorial reorganisation, confirming the fundamental weakness of Austria's post-war geopolitical situation, with major implications for the first two points. Firstly, the failure of a post-Napoleonic ideology for Europe was ultimately a spiritual failing, a failure to restore the Holy Roman Empire, replacing it instead with a holy covenant, a misnomer from its inception. Here I shall read some segments from Evola's recognitions on Metternich and Malninsky and Deponchon's Occult War. I have a discussion pertaining to these two sources which I have linked in the description. Whoever signs the death sentence of old Austria ratifies the formula of destruction of Europe. And this is because Austria still embodied, at least in general terms, the idea of the Holy Roman Empire, that a regime capable of gathering numerous nationalities without oppressing or denaturing them. In the absence of such a formula, and in the face of the persistence of exasperated nationalisms and devastating internationalisms, it would seem that it was forbidden to think that Europe would one day find its unity, which it seems is the only essential condition for its own existence as an autonomous civilization. Metternich himself was able to recognise in democracy and nationalism the main forces that were going to wipe out traditional Europe unless radical action had ended up suffocating them. He saw the profound concatenation of different forms of subversion that, based on liberalism and constitutionalism, would lead to collectivism and ultimately communism in the 20th century. In Metternich's eyes, the remedy was the idea of the state, the state as an elevated reality and founded on the principle of true sovereignty and authority, and not as a simple expression of the demos. Metternich refused to believe in nations, in which he sees only as a mask of revolution. As for its creation, the Holy Covenant was the last attempt to assure Europe of a fruitful peace for entire generation, but which did not live up to its founding principles. In any case, de Maistre has already outlined the essentials when he stated that it was not a question of making a contrary revolution, but the opposite of revolution, that is, to take positive political action from spo solid spiritual and traditional foundations so that the elimination of all that is subversion and usurpation of the low would be a natural consequence. While on the one hand, nationalism corresponds to a construction and an artificial entity, 
on the other hand, through the power of myths and the confusing ideas that are evoked in order to hold together and galvanise a, hum a given human group. This entity remains open in influences that make it act according to the general plan of subversion. Modern nationalisms, with their intransigence, blind egoism and crude will to power, their antagonisms, social unrest and their wars they have generated, have truly been the instruments of a complete destructive process. Europe had the chance, if not to stop, at least to contain and disaggregate this process in a rather wide geopolitical area after the fall of Napoleon, who, though he revived the imperial symbol and yearned for a Roman consecration, he still remain, remained the son of the French Revolution, the virus of which he helped to spread into the remaining states of traditional and aristocratic Europe as a result of the upheavals brought about by his victorious campaigns. Through the Holy Covenant or Holy Alliance, it would have been possible to create a dam against the fate of the last times. Metternich may rightly be considered the last great European. Nobody was able to see like him, with the same far-sighted lucidity and the same overall view with the interplay of subversive forces, as well as the only way to immediately neutralise them. Metternich saw all the most essential points that revolutions are not spontaneous outbursts or mass phenomena, but rather artificial phenomena that are provoked by alien forces, that nationalism, as it emerged in his own day and age, was only the mask of revolution, that revolution was essentially an international event, and that individual revolutionary phenomena are only localised and partial manifestations of the same subversive current of global proportions. Metternich also saw very clearly the concatenation of various degrees of revolution, liberalism and constitutionalism unavoidably paved the way for democracy. This is why Metternich saw folly in coming to terms with subversion. If you give it a hand, it will soon take the arm and the rest of the body as well. Having understood the revolutionary phenomenon in its unity and essence, Metternich indicated the only possible antidote, a similar supranational front of all traditional states and the establishment of a defensive and offensive league of all the monarchs of divine right. This is what is meant by holy alliance. However, the material and spiritual requirements for the full implementation of this grandiose idea were always lacking. Around Metternich, there were not enough capable men and leaders. The unity of a defensive front on the political and social plane was a clear and evident concept. What was not so clear was the idea that was capable of being a positive reference point and a chrism for this alliance, so that it could really be holy. To begin with, in the context of religion, there was no unity, since the League was not limited only to Catholic monarchs, but it also included Protestant and Orthodox ones as well. Thus this alliance did not even have the direct and immediate sanction of the Catholic Church, the head of which never joined it. What was really needed was a revival of the spirit of the Middle Ages, better yet of the Crusades. What was really needed was not just the mere repressive action and the commitment to military intervention wherever a revolutionary flame began to flicker within the territories covered by that alliance, but rather something like a new Templarism, an order, a block of men united by a common idea and relentless in action, who could give, in every country, a living witness to the return of a superior human type. Men such as these needed rather than were needed rather than courtiers, ministers of police, prudent church leaders and diplomats, only concerned with finding a balanced solution. At the same time, an attack should have been launched on the ideal plane for a view of the world and of life. But who were the representatives of the pure traditional spirit who in that period would have been capable of extirpating the hotbeds of the rationalistic, secularistic and scientistic mentality that were the true ferments of the revolution? Where were those who could have disavowed that culture beginning in the 1700s, the royal courts and the aristocracies found it fashionable to be a part of, all those who would have been able to cover with ridicule rather than with chains, all those who romantically portrayed themselves as the apostles and martyrs of the great and noble ideas of revolution and the freedom of the people. 
lacking a true soul and having jumped at the centre of Europe's attention at the time when the Holy Roman Empire had ceased to exist even nominally, owing to the voluntary renunciation of the Habsburgs. Vienna was famous mainly as a city of waltzes. The Holy Alliance, after ensuring a parenthesis of relative peace and order in Europe, was eventually dissolved, and revolutionary nationalisms, which disintegrated the previous political and dynastic units, no longer found any tough resistance to hold their onslaught. Only in 1815 was the practical and realistic truth of history. She alone saw, through the eyes of her Chancellor, that against a plan of historical conspiracy that dates from much further back than 1789, and of total conspiracy, since it was of a religious and profane nature, it required a total and non-partial reaction, a reaction that was not directed against the immediate symptom. Poison is not cured by administrating the same poison in a sugary water. This is why the Holy Covenant could not be a continuation of the Holy Roman Empire. Since its inception, the Holy Alliance has been doomed to failure. If we carry ourselves in, th in the thought of these shores of the Blue Danube of the year 1815, where the Holy Covenant was born, we will find with amazement that in the midst of its eminently distinguished godfathers, something was missing. It was precisely the one that logically should have been the keystones of the new political and social edifice. It was the stone of the angle that Christ speaks in the Gospel, beyond which it is not possible to build unity in the diversity of that holy covenant which it aspired to be. It was the stone, we should say Peter, that was the unity in the diversity of Christian nations, from Constantine the Great to Luther. Calvin and the disciples, since the end of the 15th century, there was no spiritual unity, but a set of denominational or ideological diversity. Reform was the first revolutionary offensive, the first attack on the order at whose peak is the faith, not force alone, without any other criterion than itself. We mean the faith that it necessary uses the force, but should not be confused with the force that seeks to artificially create a faith to use it. Between these concepts there is an abyss, if the Reformation or religious revolution did not kill the divine right in its letter, it killed him in his spirit, leaving the second act a subversive task to the social and political revolution. The main point that one can draw from these experts is that a. Metternich's principal aim was to suppress the fellow travellers of revolution, nationalism and constitutionalism, and that he attempted to do this through a broad alliance of Europe's princes, in turn buttressing broad sovereignty and that b. the alliance of holy covenant was a deficient solution, as it dealt only with the immediate consequences of the French Revolution, and not the causes of the revolution itself. I have alluded to the deficiencies of Metternich systems in previous videos on this channel, yet here I intend to go further than my previous sentiments, and indeed contradict the claim that Metternich had a unique and unparalleled foresight in perceiving the dangers that the European order faced in 1815. Metternich's system relied on Austria's, and by extension his own diplomatic grace, a fickle effect when one is unable to back up one's arguments with brute force. This is not to say that Metternich was anything other than the most accomplished diplomat of the early 19th century, and the figure most responsible for an unprecedented era of peace in Europe, rather that Metternich's diplomatic genius was simply not enough. Lacking the hard power of a Napoleon, the Holy Covenant was a contrivance that a Metternich could manage. A system of collective security would be sustained by the victors of the coalition wars, Austria, Prussia, Russia and Great Britain, the first three comprising the Holy Alliance proper. Metternich was able to see from as early as 1813 that Austria needed France as both a bulwark of anti-revolution and a future ally against her current allies. As Madame de Pompadour and Mary Theresa had brought about the diplomatic revolution in the 1750s, Metternich understood that an alliance of the Bourbons and the Habsburgs, Europe's premier Catholic powers, was a remedy to the expansionism of a Protestant Prussia. The confessional differences between the powers, Catholics, Protestants and Orthodox, have already been established. But from the outset of the negotiations, the interests of the emperors, most notably Alexander I of Russia, acted against the interests of a united Europe, given his insistence on Poland. It was more than a mere matter of creating Europe's gendarmerie, but keeping the said gendarmerie united, even at the expense of the interests of the individual gendarme. 
the most obvious point of contention in Metternich's system of princely sovereignty, European primacy and confessional ambivalence was in the Ottoman Empire. Here was a sovereign, a major antagonist in the history of Europe, a former enemy of both Austria and Russia, and a Muslim ruling over Christian lands. It is no wonder that the first cracks in the new Europe emerged here. I am actually surprised that the cracks didn't emerge sooner, in 1821, when Ypsilantis crossed the Pruth, hoping for Russian support, rather than in 1826, in response to the horror of a scheme by Muhammad Ali Pasha to genocide the population of the Peloponnese and replace it with Egyptians. Metternich's belief in the defensibility of the Ottomans was as revolutionary as it was doomed. The Lutheran Revolution in Germany, combined with the Calvinist Revolution and the treaties by imposition of Augsburg and Westphalia, divorced the Holy Roman Empire from any serious sacred mission to defend the Catholic faith. The now multi-confessional empire in Germany was preserved as a legal and diplomatic necessity, while the Pope assumed the preeminent role as the defender of Catholicism. Nevertheless, the symbol of the office of Holy Roman Emperor remained a potent one. Indeed, as the formal defender of the confessional rights of the princes, Chius Regio, Aeus Religio, and by extension princely sovereignty, the emperor, as primus inter paris, first among equals of Europe's royalty, was in a unique position to preside over a multi-confessional European covenant. Indeed, this was the essence of the Habsburg mystique, conferring upon them a pan-European legitimacy. To return to this quote, Whoever signs the death sentence of old Austria ratifies the formula of the destruction of Europe. And this is because Austria still embodied, at least in general terms, the idea of the Holy Roman Empire, that of a regime capable of gathering numerous nationalities together without oppressing or denaturing them. Metternich, however, had no intention to overturn Westphalia for the sake of Habsburg, for the sake of the Habsburgs. Rather, Metternich was Westphalia's foremost exponent. The writ of Caius Regio, Aeus Religio, was extended beyond the boundaries of the former empire to now encompass all of Europe. Any serious suggestion that the Pope, as has already been suggested, would act as the rock, as Peter, in the literal sense, could form the cornerstone of a holy covenant, was absurd. The disunity of Christendom was a feature of Metternich's order, in the equally absurd belief that religious diversity and the content of the competing creeds of Europe had no bearing on the advent of the revolution, which had only been defeated by force of arms. Westphalia was a formula for peace, and a peace that spiritually bankrupted the Holy Roman Empire, as the Holy Covenant was a formula for peace which killed the Holy Roman Empire. Only a few decades prior to the 1815 Congress of Vienna, the Emperor still wielded significant power in Germany vis-à-vis -vis his princes, most notably the King of Prussia. Outside of the Emperor's direct Germanic domains were the Imperial and Free Cities, and the Imperial Knights, if one is trying to look back at some form of New Templarism, both bestowed with considerable autonomy, yet an autonomy which was in the Emperor's grant, and thus they were dependents on the Emperor. There was also the series of ecclesiastical territories, domains of the bishops, who despite their confessional differences were dependent on the emperor to guarantee their borders. This ensured that a major segment of German territory was denied to the emperor's secular rivals, yet also himself. All of this came to an abrupt end with the process of mediatization. Mediatization had already begun on a limited scale prior to Napoleon's conquests, but the conquests had the effect of totalizing mediatization. Though Napoleon would never suffer the consequences of dispossessing so many princes of so many principalities, those consequences were shouldered by the Habsburgs. The remnant lands of the Holy Roman Empire in Germany, existing only on the east bank of the Rhine, needed to provide the basis of a territorial compensation for the defeated princes. The compensations came at the expense of the imperial cities, the imperial knights and the bishoprics. Moreover, the electorates of the empire were expanded to Napoleon's benefit. It would seem that Napoleon in 1801, still only a consul of France, had designs on the Holy Roman title. Napoleon's subsequent victories will result in the loss of even more territory from the Habsburgs and steal away more of the empire's princes for Napoleon's new Rheinbund or Confederation of the Rhine. 
All that remained of the Habsburg Imperium in Germany was the imperial title itself, a title that Napoleon now insisted be abjured by the Habsburgs. Francis II was well aware that the writing was on the wall. The Holy Roman title was still an elector position, and given the allegiance of the electors, a Habsburg abjuration could only result in the election of Napoleon, de jure subordinating both Prussia and Austria to the Bonapartes. Already, a hereditary imperial title had been created for Francis II, the last Holy Roman Emperor, Emperor of Austria, and so rather than abdicating the title, he abolished it, ending the Holy Roman Empire. After the defeat of Napoleon, Napoleon's German allies, with the major exception of Saxony and Westphalia, survived. Indeed, the 38 German states of Napoleon's contrivance were replaced by the 39 states of the German Confederation. That is to say that Vienna normalised the gains. The irony here is further compounded when one considers that Luther's revolution in Germany was an aristocratic revolution, a revolution for the princes, who now had a religious pretext for amassing the wealth of the church and defying their emperor. The Peasants' War of the, 18, of the 1520s was a consequence of that revolution, but the peasants' cause was abhorred by Luther, who were instead drawn to the doctrines of Anabaptism and Zwingli. With the peasants once again defeated, it was the Protestant princes who benefited at the expense of the imperial knights. Metternich's normalisation of the Napoleonic system was in turn a furtherance of Luther's revolution. In Germany, the princes were now ascendant, and the emperor had vanished. Austria instead opted for a hereditary presidency over the new confederation. The presidency conferred on Austria diplomatic privileges, but no tangible power. More than abdicating the Holy Roman throne, the Austrians in the furtherance of anti-nationalism had abdicated in Germany. The crown of Charlemagne permanently substituted for the crown of Rudolf. At the beginning of this essay, I suggested that 1809 represented the Habsburgs' brief moment of opportunity to ride the waves of German anti-Napoleonic antipathy and Prussia's dismemberment to unite Germany. This would have represented the culmination of the dream of the Germanophile Emperor Joseph II. Metternich rose to power off the back of the failure of this policy and Austria's defeat at the Battle of Wagram. The Metternichian system that arose from Wagram, more than distancing itself from the nationalistic aspirations of Austria in 1809, anathematised them. Previously, I myself was ambivalent, even favourable, to Metternich's prescription against revolutionary nationalism. However, I have now come to the understanding that Metternich's was a misreading and reductionism of, of nationalism to a current, and by current I mean contemporary with the events of the French Revolution and Napoleon, rather than a recurrent, and therefore you can say timeless, historical phenomenon. Metternich's rebuke of nationalism in all forms was the fulcrum of his failure. In 1848, the year of Metternich's fall, Louis-Napoleon Bonaparte was elected as president of the French. Three years later, he would declare himself emperor of the French as Napoleon III. Napoleon III represented the possibilities that Metternich had denied, a conservative, Catholic and autocratic regime whose foundation was popular sovereignty, French nationalism and by that token French expansionism. Napoleon III had two disciples, Cavour in Piedmont and Bismarck in Prussia. Both mimicked the Napoleonic formula and improved it. For Cavour, this, was, this entailed uniting Italy under the French army. Indeed, Cavour's brilliance lay in his ability to dupe both the emperor of the French and the hero of Italian unification, Giuseppe Garibaldi, to act as little more than servants to the ambitions of the House of Savoy and its head, the King of Piedmont, who just so happened to be Cavour's patron. A new monarchical regime was founded off the back of popular acclamation and nationalism, and this time to Austria's humiliation. Austria's humiliation was compounded by Bismarck's reformulation of French Bonapartism, this time in service to the House of Hohenzollern in Prussia. Bismarck's policy was explicitly anti-Austrian and anti-Catholic. Within Germany, he sought and achieved Prussia's enlargement through force of arms. Carpelled with military glory, he appealed, as with Cavour, to the demos, by supporting a universal German franchise. Such was in keeping with Metternich's fear of democracy as one of the horsemen of the 
revolutionary apocalypse. But it was a political masterstroke for Bismarck. For the German princes, the spectre of the Peasants' War was revived once more, a democratic mass threatening their legitimacy. This sword of Damocles was used to cajole the remaining German princes into a Prussian hegemony. While it defanged the princes, it debarred the Austrians. A restricted franchise to the Germans in Austria, or universal franchise for all of Austria's subjects, as this proclamation would have entailed, would have served to inflame her nationality conflicts, paralyse and potentially bring about Austria's downfall. Such a gesture was not sufficient if only to counter the Prussian proposal. Nationalism, therefore, was not something antithetical to the sovereignty of princes. Indeed, if we look at Germany, Bismarck's unification sustained the German princes, with the exception of Hanover, among various others, from a potential revolution from below, as with 1848. It was Austria that suffered the most from the Italian and German unifications, not the sovereignty of princes. The consequence of Austria's nationalistic repudiation was now fully apparent. From without, the Germans and Italians under the Hohenzollerns and Savoyards had severed Austria from her spheres of influence in Central Europe, and from within, Austria was forced to acquiesce to the demands of Hungarian nationalism. So how could Austria have benefited from embracing nationalism as with 1809? Indeed, how would, have, how would it have even been possible? In 1809, the object was clear, an alliance against French imperialism. In 1815, France was defeated, and as a result of a coalition, rather than Austria standing alone with Germans. Indeed, Joseph II had already demonstrated that a German identity could not be fostered onto a multi-ethnic Habsburg empire, as the princes of Germany were also unwilling to substitute a Bonapartist yoke for a Habsburg yoke. The Habsburgs instead, by design, limited their influence to southern Germany and Saxony, and northern Italy by way of their newly minted Kingdom of Lombardy Venetia, and the Habsburg co-dominions and allies in Modena, Tuscany, Parma and Lucca. Prussia was given a free reign in the north for the first time. The concept of the Holy Roman Empire and the Austrian Empire that followed were not wedded to any one nationality something that Joseph II failed to understand, and what may have doomed the 1809 project in the long term had the Austrians defeated Napoleon. Instead, there were three national theatres, so to speak, Austria within the German Confederation, Austria in northern Italy, and Austria on the Danube and beyond the Leiter. This is trialism, a concept that would later be explored by the Habsburgs, albeit with the Slavs and the Poles, albeit this version of trialism will be a much grander version of that trialism. Combined to Austrian trialism would be a papal alliance and papal integration into the Holy Covenant, as has already been suggested. A papal alliance, ironically, is how the Habsburgs could have used Napoleon III to their advantage by rekindling the spirit of the diplomatic revolution of the 1750s, predicated on an alliance on pan-Catholicism and territorial readjustment to favour France. In 1848, Piedmont had betrayed their alliance with Austria and prematurely supported the Revolutionary Party at a time when Louis Napoleon had come to the rescue of Pope Pius IX and restored the Papal States. Neo-Gelfism, an idea predicated on expanding the Pope's temporal powers in Italy, even with a view to uniting Italy under the Pope, could have factored into this alliance as well, that and an alliance with the Bourbon kings of the two Sicilies in the south. The defeat of Piedmont could have resulted in anything from a cordon sanitaire being placed on Piedmont, coupled with the secession of territories such as Nice and Savoy, or reunion, as France would later achieve, to a Franco-Papal Austria co-dominion in Piedmont, or even the prospect of an outright partition of Piedmont. A formal alliance with the Pope, integrated into a broader alliance with Austria, France and lesser allies, as the twin pillars of Europe, would have worked further to further Austria's nationalist aspirations in Germany. Bavaria, Württemberg and Baden, now Austria's Catholic allies, would form the core of the German Empire, while Saxony and even Hanover could have served as the outer empire. An allegiance of the smaller states against Prussia. 
In such a scenario, a Klein-Deutschland solution, as was affected by Prussia with the exclusion of Austria, will be affected by Austria with the exclusion of Prussia. France will be compensated, indeed be willing, to augment Austria's position in Germany with the gain of territories on the left bank of the Rhine, which were awarded to the Prussians at Vienna. Indeed, as with Metternich's attempt to forge a compromise peace with Napoleon in 1813, the prospect of a Franco-Austrian alliance in 1813 with a Napoleon mirrored the proposals after 1848 with another Napoleon. With the formal alliance to the Pope, the situation in Germany and Austria would need to be confirmed by the formal restoration of the Holy Roman Empire. Though Francis II himself abolished the empire, the legality of this action was contested. It could be argued that the empire had not dissolved, but was simply in a state of interregnum, as had occurred so many times in the course of the empire's long history. Indeed, as the Pope had crowned Charlemagne, what better way to nullify the coronation of Napoleon, with the Pope formally crowning Francis, something that had not occurred since the coronation of Charles V in Bologna in 1530. With the restoration of the Holy Roman Empire would come with it the ancillary titles King of Germany, Italy and the Aralad. In the case of Italy, Francis held the capital of the medieval kingdom in Lombardy, and with it the iron crown of the Lombards, which Napoleon himself had used to assume the throne of Italy. The precedent was there set. Indeed, Francis may have claimed the title for himself in 1814, assuming the crown that Napoleon had just vacated. With Germany, symbolically, it would be far easier, as indeed happened, to eject a president of a confederation rather than Germany's king and emperor, where in the former Prussia's Bismarck succeeded, in the latter Prussia's Frederick II or Frederick the Great had failed. The final aspect to this nationalistic, trialist conception is the empire on the Danube, which could have only feasibly meant Hungary. In 1740, as the Habsburg monarchy, under its first female sovereign Mary Theresa, was faced with imminent disillusion, Hungary was the first kingdom to recognise her as their king. In contrast to such loyalty, 100 years later, Lajos Kossuth had erected a new Hungary, independent of the Habsburgs, the template for all Hungarian nationalists to follow. The breach in the relationship occurred under Joseph II, refusing to accept a Hungarian coronation which would bind him to Hungary's ancient privileges, antithetical to his pro-German administrative reform programme. In emphasising the Italo-German character of the Holy Roman Empire, I see no alternative for the Habsburgs to proact than to proactively grant a sweeping set of privileges to the Hungarians in the east, in the domain of St. Stephen, and even perhaps in the Polish-dominated region of Galicia. Such a bold move may have instilled the same fervent loyalty to the Habsburgs from the Hussars of Hungary as with the Cossacks to the Tsar in Russia. Such arguments pertaining to these missed opportunities of nationalism, return inevitably to the allocation or misallocation of territory, the final shortcoming of the Congress of Vienna. More than pertaining to nationalism, the territorial settlement imperiled Austria's purported defence of the Catholic faith and the viability of the Holy Covenant's aims of collective security and anti-revolution. In 1795, Austria, at least on paper, was at its territorial zenith, from its traditional core of Austria proper, Bohemia and Hungary, were recently added the partitions of Poland, which had arguably favoured Austria more than Russia or Prussia. In addition to Galicia, Austria was awarded the majority of Mazovia, land south of Warsaw, territory that Austria would hold until 1809. From there were the territories of Lombardy and Italy, and the Austrian Netherlands, corresponding to modern-day Belgium territories that Austria would surrender to France two years later. Austria would briefly acquire Venice, also, after the Republic fell to Napoleon in 1797. By 1809, Napoleon had sundered much of the territory of the old imperial corps from Tyrol to the new French provinces of Illyria. It was of course expected that Austrian territory would either be restored or compensated for with the fall of Napoleon. But despite this, Austrian concerns were dictated by a desire to form a continuous empire in Central Europe, with pride of place in southern Germany and northern Italy. 
to the empire, with its borders defined before the final partition of Poland, were added the Republic of Venice, which was under Austrian control intermittently before the Battle of Austerlitz. This coalesced into the kingdom of Lombardy-Venetia, which confirmed also Austrian dominance over the Adriatic. To establish the continuous empire, Austria was forced to surrender Polish territory to Russia. Mazovia was given up, as was Krakow, in exchange for a strip of land in Ternopol, seized by the Russians from Austria in 1809. Austria was only spared further concessions to Russia in Galicia due to the adroit political politicking of Metternich and his French counterpart Talleyrand, integrating France back into the nations of Europe as a necessary counter to Russian expansionism. Were that not the case, Russia would have most likely taken possession of all Polish territory, as was Alexander I's stated goal. While war between Russia and Austria had been averted, this does not account for Metternich's remarkable ambivalence towards the Austrian Netherlands. The Austrian Netherlands had been a vital Habsburg possession since the 15th century. It was the original domain of Charles V, from which the term House of Burgundy, used interchangeably with that of the Netherlands, competed for the usage, uh, competed for usage with the term House of Austria to best describe the Habsburgs. The North was lost in 1579 to the Dutch Republic, but the South remained loyal until the Bavarian War of Succession in 1778, where Joseph II made it obvious that he considered the territory expendable and in 1790 there was a revolution in Brabant against his reforms. Until then, the territory was the front line against French expansionism. The 1792 coalition um, expedition against France was launched from there, yet after the Battle of Fleurs in 1794, France conquered the territory. Even as Napoleon faced defeat, Metternich was willing to countenance continued French control of the Austrian Netherlands, and as Napoleon refused ever every single peace overture, the region was instead awarded to the Protestant Dutch, something the Austrians had fought for two centuries to prevent. Indeed, the notables of Brabant partitioned the Austrians to restore the ancient Habsburg rule of the province. The Austrians were gifted Belgium, and consciously rejected it. With a wealthy Catholic population placed under a poorer and autocratic Protestant Dutch king, this union was truly bizarre and doomed to fail, which it did in 1830. I previously referenced Austria's aspirations to assume the mantle of their former European imperium, but without willing to take responsibility for it. Belgium is the prime example. Firstly, Austria was prepared to surrender millions of their loyal subjects with a rich and storied connection to the Habsburgs for dubious strategic motives. Secondly, in pursuit of this multi-confessional alliance, the misnomer that was the Holy Covenant, Austria was prepared to sacrifice Catholic populations to what they would have considered heretic rulers. The same situation is true of the Russians in Poland and the Prussians in Cologne and the Rhineland. Thirdly, Austria was at once cozying up to the French, which may account for their desire to eliminate a direct border, yet unwilling to cede the region to the Bourbons, as they had been willing to Napoleon. Such a gesture would have buttressed an unpopular regime accused of giving up French territories. Surrendering Belgium to the Bourbons may have even thwarted Napoleon's return and restoration during the Hundred Days. Instead, awarding the territory to the Dutch under the protection of the British and territories on the German left bank of the Rhine to the Prussians left the French under no illusion that the new European order perceived France as a future aggressor. Austria was caught between contradictory views of the French as allies and enemies. If the latter view prevailed, Austria had given up any interest in intervening in France, something that would later prove a disaster for it was in France that the first legitimate monarch, Charles X, was deposed. Rather than the Austrians intervening from Belgium in a position of strength to assist the cause of their ally, they were impotent. To compound the mockery of Austria's decision to vacate Belgium, the revolution that, had failed to, that they had failed to suppress in France travelled to Belgium itself, deposed the Dutch king, and established a bourgeois monarchy on the model of France and under the protection of the British. The Prussians and the British were unwilling to intervene. The Russians, thwarted by a revolution in Poland, were unable to intervene. The Holy Covenant's mission of collective security and anti-revolution had failed. 
Here I should reference Melinsky again on the consequences of 1830. The revolution of 1830 was a case in the policy of intervention. The legitimate monarchs, by the grace of God, had mutually guaranteed their legitimacy. Now the insurrection was chasing a legitimate king by the grace of God, thus a ruler whom only God could remind him of, or failing that, his rightful successor. This one existed, and yet it was another that was chosen. This other realised the type of mentality of the right middle, bourgeois mentality and mediocrity par excellence. This, of course, was Louis-Philippe. He represented both the royal tradition and the revolutionary tradition in this person. He was chosen because this was the good pleasure of the people, king of the French, not king of France. That is, not hereditary owner of France, but rather the first official of the country. Like any official, he was therefore revocable. Officially, even, he was no longer king by the grace of God, but by the national will, a new formula to which only one has to think to see that what it expressed was no longer monarchy, but the republic. It is royalty which is somehow emptied of that principle, that is, its raison d'etre. But if all European nations are now on this path, this was not the cause in 1830. So it was France alone was left alone with apparent, without apparently slamming the doors, as if nothing had happened. Indeed, this was later ratified by the Pope himself a few years down the line. As a result of the French Revolution of 1830, the single front of the counter-revolution counter was depressed. France would hencely be the breeding ground for revolutionary ideas that would culminate in the revolutions of 1848. With Austria's position of anti-revolution and collective security made a nonsense, culminating in the revolutions in France, Europe and Metternich's own fall, I shall cover one significant point concerning territory and the doom of Austria, this time in Germany. Perhaps the most significant and ironic of all territorial awards for Prussia was in the Rhineland of Westphalia. The Rhineland was predominantly Catholic. Westphalia had been created as a kingdom by Napoleon for his brother Jerome. Prussia's historical interest was in the Cleavesmark, but an ascendant Prussia in the northwest was a novelty. Prussia's 18th century trajectory for expansion was eastwards. Indeed, Frederick II desired to carve out a single continuous Prussian kingdom from Silesia to East Prussia on the ruin of Poland. By 1795, Prussia had taken Warsaw. Over the next ten years, Prussia had benefited from the success of Napoleon by doing precisely nothing, appropriating territory during the mediatization and receiving Hanover following Napoleon's expulsion of the King of Great Britain as elector. After Prussia's disastrous war with Napoleon, all of their western territories were confiscated, leading a continuous strip of land connecting Breslau to Berlin and Berlin to Konigsberg. Following Napoleon's defeat, the object of Prussia's restoration was based on revenge, revenge against Saxony for switching sides, in turn realising the ambition of Frederick the Great to conquer it. As with Austria, Prussia's desire to restore her position in Poland were denied by the Russians. The Prussians only received a portion of Saxony, indeed because of Austria's intervention. Instead, the Prussian award was in the West, creating a second Prussia, a British contrivance, as Britain wanted Prussia to assume the role of watchman against France, a position Austria had just abdicated through renouncing Belgium. While this policy, again, illustrates the anti-Catholic formula of the Holy Covenant, this region, with its Ruhr Valley, would later serve as the industrial expansion of Prussia and Germany. I don't consider it reasonable to blame Metternich for not vetoing what we can now see, with the benefit of hindsight, was Prussia's deliverance. Indeed, the advantages to Prussia were not readily apparent in a world where only Britain had begun to industrialise, and economic concerns were secondary to strategic concerns. That said, the Prussian gains in the Rhineland had only become a strategic necessity as a consequence of Austria surrendering Belgium in the first place. This should only highlight that Austria navigated the question of territorial compensation poorly. Given Austria's legal possessions in 1795, she had grounds to demand more territory than she later acquired. Though Austria was now a single territory, it was a smaller one, and one which was so ethnically diverse that one can forgive Metternich's pro-phobia of nationalism. 
Prussia, meanwhile, had expanded its population and exchanged its Polish population for a German one, leaving her in pride of position to lead the unification of Germany. Joseph II had used every opportunity for territorial exchange to advance into Germany, to realise a German destiny for Austria, until thwarted by Prussia in the War of Bavarian Succession. Though Bavaria had sided with Napoleon, Austria's demands of Bavaria after the war were modest, the reclamation of the Tyrol to be compensated for Bavaria with the award of Franconia. Prussia had realised a German destiny by accident. Indeed, the personal irony for Metternich is that his home city of Koblenz was now a part of Prussia. Metternich presented a spectre, a spectre of Habsburg glory and the prestige of the Holy Roman Empire now gone. That spectre, coupled with his diplomatic brilliance, was enough to ensure decades of peace in Europe. But his achievement was for Europe, not for Austria, for Austria's mission was essentially altruistic, for peace and not the fervence of Austrian self-interest. One can rightly say that Metternich was the last European, but he was a poor Austrian, and when he fell from power, Austria's star dwindled, a mere cog in a system dependent on the foresight of one man. It would take Bismarck to show that one could align national self-interest with the peace of Europe. Indeed, Bismarck's victory over Metternich was so total as to both mantle Metternich as the honest broker of the continent and reduce Austria to a mere expedient of German foreign policy, an expedient which would later become a liability and ultimately a corpse.